G'day and welcome to my first video on sprint orienteering. Um, this is going to be a series of videos breaking down the, some different topics about sprint orienteering. This video is going to be on what I call the mechanical technical aspect of sprint orienteering. Um, the next videos are going to be on the mental technical, the physical preparation and pre-race preparation for sprint orienteering. Um, people who coach orienteering spend a lot of time talking about the what I call the mental technical aspects of orienteering and often they neglect the what I'm going to call mechanical technical aspect of orienteering which is all of the things that you do automatically uh, during a course that assist you with the mental technical aspect so examples of this are thumbing the map keeping the map orientated map folding accelerating out of controls accelerating around corners jumping down stairs that sort of thing a lot of these uh, things that are quite advanced techniques, but they can save you quite a lot of time in sprint orienteering. And because they're neglected, I think, by a lot of coaches, I think uh, if you can incorporate these into your sprint orienteering, there's a lot of seconds to be gained just by focusing on some of these things in your training. Just a quick disclaimer before we get into the meat of the video, that this is for as much my benefit as anyone else's benefit. I'm clearly not a sprint orienteering expert, although I... I do hope to improve over time and I, I feel like it's a useful exercise to um, carry out analysis of your own sprint orienteering and the sprint orienteering of experts. So I find it's a really useful um, exercise for myself to make this video and uh, if you happen to get any benefit out of it then uh, that's really good too. Alrighty, so I'm just going to chuck on some royalty free music and let's get into it. The first thing I wanted to talk about, which is kind of specific to sprint orienteering, is um, a technique that I like to call two-handed map reading, which is often used by a lot of the best orienteers in sprint orienteering in uh, technical situations or at the start of the course where they really want to get some intense map reading. So I think two-handed map reading is specific to um, sprint orienteering in a lot of ways because you can use that second hand to really steady the map and maintain speed um, because the terrain isn't really super tough and you don't need that swing arm to get through the terrain and you don't you need your other arm to sort of bash through the, the leaves so you can use that second hand without too much punishment obviously it's not as good as running with one hand if you want to get max speed um, but in terms of steadying the map it's really advantageous and I've got an example here of Jonas Leanderson who's doing quite a technical sprint orienteering training and you can see for the almost entire first control he's running with both hands on the map um, using that, that right hand to steady the map and uh, as you can see when he gets into the less technical areas he takes that right hand off the map and he does use it to generate a bit more force to get the, the running going but it's just one of those things that I don't think we're really taught and often we don't really think about but I think when when you're starting a course or when you're going into a technical area or when you're trying to plan ahead and you really want to steady the map and get a really good look at it it can give you that extra edge and just allow you to maintain speed uh, and and get that extra steady map look which I think is quite important so Jonas Leanderson uses this technique quite a lot but um, we've got a video here of Morten Bostrom from Finland who uses the technique too so you can see he does, uh, when he starts the course, he's using the, the map in both hands. It really helps fold the map as well as if you want to fold the map. And I think it helps with thumbing the map as well because you can use one hand to hold while you use the other, the other hand to shuffle around and, and thumb the map there. But you can see when he's, when he's in a technical, intense section of the course, he's really using that two-handed technique. Just as a final example, I've got some more footage from Gorda and Winblad um, from one of the training camps in Spain, and this is Tove Alexanderson. Obviously not sprint orienteering, but you can see that she's using the two-handed technique. She's just starting the course and she's trying to take in as much information as possible, and I think using that two-handed technique is really effective at the start of a course, especially trying to... Uh, read a lot of detail while going into a technical area. So this is another good example even though it's not a sprint example. Alright, so the next thing I wanted to talk about, it's a bit boring and it's pretty fundamental, but it's thumbing the map. And uh, we're going to have a look at some of the footage from Morton Bostrom again because it's uh, quite hard to get chess cam footage of sprint orienteering. 
but you can see that Morton is uh, he uses a, a wrist compass instead of a thumb compass but he's using his, his thumb there to to keep his position in and in sprint orienteering it's particularly important to thumb the map because sprint orienteering requires quite a, a high frequency of map reading uh, quick looks at the map but very often so if you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out where you are on the on the page again it can be quite counterproductive so the idea with thumbing the map is that you keep your thumb vaguely in the location that you are and then when you look down um, you, you can basically look at the tip of your thumb and, and you'll know exactly where you are on the page and then you can actually start taking in information so we want to reduce that amount of dead time that's um, that's there when you look down at the map especially when you're reading the map at high frequency like you do in sprint orienteering now in sprint orienteering it is somewhat difficult to keep thumbing the map because the scale can be quite small so we usually use a one to four thousand map which means that you're moving around the page really quickly so Whereas in the forest, if it's 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 15,000, and you're moving quite a lot slower. So the, um, the thumbing the map, you don't actually have to move around that much, but in sprint, you have to move quite quickly. Um, this is doubly so if you're running on a 1 to 3,000 or 1 to 2,000 map, where you, you could find yourself from one end of the page to the other in you know less than a minute. So yeah, it, it is difficult in sprint, but I think it's important in sprint, and it's something that you need to focus on. And uh, something to think about is maybe the benefit of using a, a wrist compass rather than a thumb compass because I feel like if you use your actual thumb to thumb the map it, it feels more natural and it's just a bit easier to thumb the map and, and you can do it uh, a bit more quickly. So this is one of those things that should be completely habitual when you're sprint orienteering in a race so it shouldn't be something that you're thinking about during a race and I, I think the way you make this become a habit is is you just practice it so you go out and you could do a sprint orienteering course and your number one focus in that training is to thumb the map and just to keep thumbing the map and you just ignore all of the other things you know you, you ignore things like route choice and all these other things so you're just 100% of your focus in that training is thumbing the map 100% of the time um, and do that over and over and over again and eventually it will become habitual and you won't have to think about it because if you are thinking about thumbing the map in the race you're going to be ignoring more important things like route choice like keeping your location you know map contact and that sort of thing right so this next point is a quick one but it's about map folding and um, map folding is obviously a part of orienteering both sprint and forest um, and in forest orienteering some people do recommend that you fold the map parallel to your direction of travel and I find that can be useful in the forest but in sprint I think um, every second counts and I think basically you want to just do anything to get the map small enough so that you can thumb the map so I think folding the map in sprint really does just serve to allow you to thumb the map and whatever fold allows you to do that while seeing the next couple of legs ahead ideally is is perfect so there's not too much to it um, and you can see here I just got some more footage of Morton Bostrom he, he favors a uh, the technique of folding it into quite a small piece um, and this course allows him to do that because there's a lot of legs that are overlapping and in, in uh, one small area but but I think any any fold that you can do to just make sure that your thumb is right there where you are uh, is, is fine okay so the last map related part that I wanted to talk about is map orientation and in sprint you're going to be coming into a lot of corners, running around corners, going into controls where you're rapidly changing direction, maybe 180 degrees a lot of the time. So it really helps if you can have that map orientated correctly before you go around that corner or before you go into the control so that by the time you go around that corner or um, exit the control the map is already facing the right way and there's a lot of overlap here with the mental technical aspect of planning ahead and I think if you're planning ahead at least one control or you're at least you have an exit direction but in sprint I recommend that you're planning ahead at least one control at all times but if if even if you just have an exit direction you'll be able to have that map in the right direction and when you leave you won't have to spend that two or three seconds just sort of fidgeting with the map making sure that it's facing north uh, and if you can just keep the map vaguely facing north the whole time um, it doesn't have to be 100% correct but if it's just sort of facing the right way it really helps your brain to to put that map to ground 
and it avoids using uh, a lot of higher order of thinking and some people can run around an entire sprint course with the map facing the wrong way um, but uh, I find that it just makes it easier on the brain if it's facing the right way most of the time um, so if you're running around a corner or you're coming into a control just know which way you're going and which way the map should be facing once you've gone around that corner or punched that control and that'll just save you so much hassle and make the, the technical aspect of the sport a lot easier um, and the way to, to practice this just like with thumbing the map it's quite a rudimentary thing but just do sprint orienteering with this as your key focus just do a, a few courses where all you're focused on is making sure that when you go around the corners or you go into controls you, you keep turning that map around and making sure that it's facing the right way so this is the same process that we used with thumbing the map uh, just keep that key focus on one thing and just ignore all of those other aspects and just focus this course all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a few intervals and all I'm going to do is work on map orientation alrighty so we're moving away from the map focus stuff now and I want to talk about the physical stuff to do with ori um, spin orienteering so all of the things that mean that you can get your body around the course as quickly as possible and there's definitely a lot of differences between track running or a flat 5k and the ability to get yourself around a sprint orienteering course as quickly as possible and the physiological needs I think there are similarities but there are also a lot of differences um, and so I've, I've got some footage here of uh, Mock 2017 uh, this was a so I'm not exactly sure on the details of exactly where this is it's somewhere in the Mediterranean but it is a knockout sprint uh, featuring some of the best sprint orienteers in the world so you can see we've got a uh, Fredo Tronchard here from France who came to Australia last year Tim Robertson who is an amazing technical orienteer and he's fantastic at the specific physical demands of sprint orienteering and uh, we've got some other guys here who are fantastic sprint orienteers um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is stairs and unfortunately this video doesn't really have very much focus on stairs but stairs are a, a thing uh, particularly running downstairs I don't think anyone has any issues running upstairs there's no real issues with confidence uh, running upstairs and I think people usually don't lose too much time running upstairs but they do lose time running downstairs because they have a bit of a lack of confidence and they haven't practiced running downstairs quickly and I thought I was alright at running downstairs until it was brought to my attention by Toppy Surya Leinen uh, who's a Finnish walk runner when he came over to Australia and noticed that a lot of the people from Australia were really bad at running downstairs and he showed us how he ran downstairs and it was a lot faster he would often take an entire staircase at once he would just jump down the whole thing or he would often take five or six stairs at a time um, and it's something that can save quite a chunk of time it, it, you know in comparison to someone like myself who would take two or three stairs at a time Toppy would be taking five or six and he'll be moving at almost twice the speed and he doesn't need to accelerate out of the staircase once he's finished so he was saving a lot of time with almost no mental effort required so in every sprint orienteering course if there were three staircases he was getting maybe six to ten seconds on me just with his ability to run downstairs um, and this is something that I think is really practicable so you can just go over to any staircase if you've got one nearby and sort of come up with a running start and practice taking more and more stairs at a time or jumping down an entire flight of stairs at a time um, and I think it's really a practicable skill and practicing it will give you confidence and you'll be able to pull that off without very much mental expenditure in a sprint race obviously this isn't for everyone and for juniors I recommend that you just keep going how you're going let your body develop and I don't want you slamming down an entire flight of stairs because it's not the best thing for your needs but I think if you're an elite athlete and you have a little bit of strength behind you you know it doesn't hurt to do a bit more strength training for your quads but I think if you're an elite athlete in orienteering you have the physiological capability to jump downstairs and I think it becomes more of a psychological confidence issue and I think it's just free time out there that people should be taking
So I'm going to keep showing this footage from Mock because I, I think it's a really good illustration of the other points to do with the physical, technical aspect of sprint orienteering. So the second thing I wanted to talk about with regards to the physical, technical aspect of orienteering is anticipating corners. And there's a lot of footage of people running around corners in this in this footage that I'm showing you now. You can see if the athlete knows which you know when when they're going to be going around the corner, they can actually um, they can maintain their full speed while going around that corner, which is a really really important skill in sprint orienteering because we're often going around corners, you know, every every few seconds in sprint orienteering, and there's a lot of time to be gained if you can maintain speed around corners and, and can properly execute corners. So you can see here a lot of the time they will move out wide and then sort of come around at the apex of the corner um, to maintain that speed. And a lot of this, there is a lot of crossover with the mental technical aspect where if the athlete knows which corner they're taking, they can plan ahead and then they can anticipate the corner and and properly move around it but if you see there are a few examples in this video where the athlete isn't really on top of their navigation and they don't know that they're going to be taking a corner and they're just sort of watching the athletes in front of them and the difference between the athlete who knows that they're going around that corner and the anticipation and the speed they're able to carry around that corner and the athlete who has to almost stop and check that they're going around that corner is huge so I think corner running is a big part of sprint orienteering and just that uh, that ability to sort of accelerate out of a corner and it's one of those key differences that I was talking about between doing a flat 5k or a flat 3k and doing sprint orienteering because there's no corners really in a, in a track race whereas in orienteering you're often going around very sharp corners and you have to maintain that speed so I think it's one of those things, again, you can practice it just like the map things, you can practice, okay, I'm just going to do some sprint orienteering and today I'm going to focus on really holding speed around corners and you'd be surprised how how much speed you're giving away when you orienteer normally in comparison to when you're trying to maintain high speed and anticipating corners. So the final thing I want to talk about with regards to the physical, technical aspect of sprint orienteering is um, how we punch controls. And obviously now we have touch SI or SI Air in, in most orienteering events in Australia. That does change how we, um, how we interact with controls and it changes um, how we are able to flow through controls because before SI Air you had to almost come to a stop at, at every control uh, and you had to accelerate from from pretty much a, start, uh, a standing position um, which was quite taxing on the body and now we're able to flow through the controls but um, I still think that the best way to approach a control is to sort of when you're about five to ten seconds out of the control is to come into it um, and ease ease off a little bit because this when you when you ease off from top speed a little bit coming into the control you you don't lose that much speed, you might, you know, you're decelerating, you lose a little bit of speed. And this does several things for us. It allows us to have a little bit of a break in terms of the cardiovascular system. We're giving the heart and the lungs a little bit of a break for a few seconds before we accelerate again. But also it actually makes us more agile and it allows us to get a little bit more map contact because we're not pushing at 100% we're slowing down a bit we can we can read the map a little bit more get a bit more focus on the map and at the same time we're more agile so we can move around corners uh, and react to the things that are around the control a little bit uh, faster so I think slowing down when you're entering the control is really valuable in sprint orienteering just a little bit and then once we exit the control really focus on five or six steps of real acceleration like real effort to to get up to full speed again and it's sort of like um, the tactic in in cross-country racing where you really focus on pushing those uphills and we sort of glide the downhills and we maintain on the, on the flats and then when we get to that uphill which is essentially when we when we punch the control and we're exiting a control we really focus on accelerating out of the control um, and that gets us back to top speed you know and I, I think 
it's quite easy to get into a rhythm in sprint orienteering where we sort of just ease out of the control and then ease up to top speed but it's just seconds lost that that, that you um, can't afford at the top level so if you is again one thing that you can practice is use your process of coming into controls come in slow down a little bit on the way in get that map contact make sure that you've got a plan for the next control come in slow and then punch the control and really focus on accelerating whether that's in the same direction as you were coming or whether you have to turn around 180 degrees all right so to summarize we've been through the two-handed map reading technique thumbing the map map folding orienting the map and then the physical technical aspects of the sport which I summarized as stairs anticipating corners and how we approach controls okay so that's all I've got regarding the mechanical technical aspect of sprint orienteering and as I said I think it's one of the aspects that is really practicable you can go and do this on a lot of the things you can practice without actually being on a sprint map but a lot of them do require you being on a sprint map but they're very practicable and they're things that once they become habitual will just save you save you so many seconds when you're out on the sprint uh, course in, on the race so uh, that's the first video in this series the next video I'm going to be focusing on the mental technical aspect which really is the bulk of what coaches focus on and I think it is the most important part of sprint orienteering um, so that'll include things like route choice um, planning ahead maintaining map contact and all of these things that we need to be focusing on during the race all right that's all for now thanks for watching and hopefully i will have a, another video on the mental technical aspect out soon cheers